The following program depicts real events. It contains scenes of dramatic reenactment and actual news archive and has scenes of a violent nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome home, Gary. You well, Frankie. <clears throat> Any birds, Nathie? Nah. Fuck all birds. All right, you all calm down, relax. That's on me, they die. You hear me? In September 2006, Gary Campion murdered his friend and fellow gangster, Frankie Ryan. Both men had been enforcers for Limerick's notorious Dundon McCarthy gang. So why had Campion killed his old pal? Was he announcing to the world that he was switching sides? Or had his hand been swayed by darker forces? Was Campion destined for this moment? Or could he have taken a different path? Over 5% of Irish homicides are contract killings. And that figure is rising year on year. We've got one of the highest rates of gangland assassination in the developed world. What does that say of this country? To help me explore why Ireland has become a mecca for assassins, I'll be joined by forensic criminologist David Wilson. As a former prison governor and an academic, he has over 30 years experience of the criminal underworld. Together we have identified four types of assassins operating in these islands. Novices, journeymen, dilettantes, and masters. Each has a unique set of characteristics and traits. In this series, we're going to try and delve into the mindset of the hitman and try and explain why Ireland has become one of the contract-killing centres of the planet. The hit really was a statement, very public, done in the full view of the entire neighbourhood. OK. And I really want to know what's driving that. And the other thing that really struck me is I don't really know that much about his family circumstances. Do you think you could try and do some research on that for me? What sort of background did Gary Campion have? On the 8th of July, 2009, Gary Campion was convicted of the murder of Frankie Ryan. He made history as the first person in Ireland to be convicted of two gangland murders. 
He was just 25 years of age, yet he'd been involved in violent crime since his teenage years. Just how did this young man become one of the most notorious gangsters in the history of the Irish underworld? Limerick is a modern and vibrant city which has undergone a dramatic renaissance in recent years, allowing it to leave its violent past behind it. But to understand Gary Campion, you have to go back to the start of the millennium when a violent gang war had erupted on the streets of Limerick. The latest victim of Limerick violence lay under this tent. The deceased to bread delivery man pulled into the, the service station. James Cronin is taken from the wasteland. Young men clad in black suits who walked the two-mile journey behind the hearse that carried Journalist Nicola Talent covered the gang violence that erupted in Limerick. So what kick-started this Limerick feud? Now, a feud had developed between Christy Keane, who was the undisputed godfather of crime here, and he was the person who introduced drugs and controlled drugs in the city. But the McCarthy family were starting to sort of chip away. They wanted to, they wanted a bit of the action. And they just didn't have the power um, in the meantime, the Dundon family, who were their cousins, they had been living in England, uh, four Dundon boys and a sister, with their father, Kenneth Dundon. They were a hugely violent family, and they joined up with the McCarthys. And the Dundons were essentially the muscle the McCarthys needed to actually take on Christy Keane and his, his gang. They were actually a, a traveller gang, and the first traveller gang who had moved into organised crime, into drug crime. While financially they were never very successful, the violence they brought into that was something that we hadn't really seen in Ireland before. Soon after the Dundons arrived in Limerick, the teenage Gary Campion became involved in their criminal enterprises. I'm driving into Limerick and I'm trying to get to a particular housing estate, which is where Gary Campion is from. And what I'm trying to do when I'm there is work out a simple criminological question. Is it nature or nurture? In other words, does Gary Campion become a hitman because of the environment that he's brought up in, his nurturing, or is it something more about him, his psychology, his personality? Does he become a hitman because of his nature? His father was a known criminal involved in assaults. The mother had died and the father, who was a chronic alcoholic, reared them. To understand more about Campion's upbringing, I meet crime correspondent Ken Foy. What was Gary Campion's background? His two older brothers, Noel and William, were very serious criminals. William is still in jail where he's serving a life sentence for the murder of a farmer in County Clare back in 1998. Gary's other brother, Noel, was a career criminal as well. Um, he served a number of jail sentences, including a lengthy sentence for an armed robbery. So these were the role models in Gary's uh, life. And by the time he was a uh, in his mid-teens, he was already well known to Gardaí and was making court appearances. Anthony Kelly was a neighbour of the Campion family in South Hill. The Campions, they lived in here. There was, there's a, there was another house in here that's after being demolished. Uh -huh. It's only demolished there a couple of years ago. And there was another house at the other side. So you've been neighbours with the Campions for yeah, some time? well, I know them since I was young and small, you know. Yeah. So probably, what, 20, 30, 40 years? Over 30 years, at least. And what were they like as neighbours? Well, they were a good family, like. Yeah. They were very good, and the mother and father were two decent people and done the best to rear the kids, and to rear their kids the same as anyone else. But when the feuding started in Limerick, young people got tied up in it. A lot of the people at the time aligned themselves to one faction or the other. And when they're young, they're vulnerable. 
and the senior people issues the instructions out to them. These young fellas at the time thought they're great. I'm in a gang, I'm, I'm brilliant now. There's no one to mess with me. And next minute, the senior people in, in, in the, the gangs and say, you have to do this for me. And that's, once they go down that line, then it's the end of them like. And how must a young person who's been told by one of the gang leaders feel about going out and taking someone's life? Well, at the time, most of the people in the gangs, even though they were young knows, if they don't carry out the, scene, the instructions of the senior people, there could be a hit done to them. So it was hit or be hit? Well, in a lot of the cases in Limerick, that's the way it is. As a criminologist, I'm always learning. And what was interesting in talking to Anthony is he produced another type of hitman in his discussions. He said there was the hit or be hit hitman. Anthony also conjured up a picture for me about the social conditions that produce hitmen like Gary Campion. He's not born that way, he's made that way because of the limitation of the opportunities that are available to him. If Campion's upbringing meant that he was destined for a life of crime... The pigs are on the way, come on now, will you? Move! What made him become a killer? Your fucking mistress to call me. By his teens, Gary Campion had a fearsome reputation for violence. But this was to accelerate when the Campion family moved across Limerick City from South Hill to the Dundon McCarthy stronghold of Moy Ross. States like South Hill and Moy Ross and Balnacarra Weston um, really became breeding grounds for for the gang warfare we saw in Limerick because of the, I suppose, the, the huge levels of, of unemployment. Levels of social depravity in those estates which were essentially ignored, I suppose, recognised as being uh, examples of um, urban planning disasters, really. There were fertile grounds um, for, I suppose, dis disillusioned teenagers who had no prospect, who no jobs, no prospect of a job, um, of getting involved in, in serious organised criminality. In the mid 2000s, a group of Franciscan friars were sent to Moiras to act as peacemakers. Father Charles is one of the monks helping to heal divisions within the community. What was the community like when you first came here? Well, there, there were a lot of violence uh, caused by feuds between families, but the families here, it's like gangs and quite often related with drug trade and, and things like that. But not, not just that, there, there were some rivalries and all that. <clears throat> so it, it was very, very violent. The, some of our neighbors had iron shutters to avoid uh, straight bullets. Uh, you would have regularly young lads stealing a car just for a joyride. So no one would park in the street like this. It was <laughs> if you wanted to, to get your car back without being bumped or crashed. Just by, uh, see, joyride, they would bump into the cars. Uh, <laughs> on their ways, they didn't care. So that's why people would park like, like there, in, in their driveway. Whereas now, people are much more free to... So, uh, just, just to give you an idea, to come all the way here, we would have had to go through two checkpoints with armed guardy, with anti-bulletproof, uh, I mean bulletproof vests, uh, to get here. That's, that's the atmosphere. And of course, you came immediately from Yonkers in New York. Gosh, that's a, what was that, what was that like for you, New York to Limerick? Well, see, 
anywhere we we live is is this kind of neighborhood. So in many ways, it wasn't too much of a uh, of a difference in regard to the violence. The big difference, though, is in New York, whether it's in Harlem, in the Bronx, or in Yonkers, mm. it's so big that you know you might know what gang hit you, but you don't know the people. Whereas here, you'll know not only which family hit you, but which member of the family hit you. It's very face-to-face -face here, isn't it? I've picked that up immediately. Everybody seems to know everybody else. There's a history that goes back for exactly. generations. Exactly, but that means it's harder to diffuse the feuds. Criminologist Emma Kelly understands the culture of violence that came to dominate Limerick during the feuding years. I think any young person is susceptible to the people around them and the influences around them. And so with Gary Campion as a, as a youngster, he only had the same type of people around him, which were male, hard males and criminal. And so he gradually progressed to be like people around him. So in terms of nature versus nurture, I don't think he was born a criminal. I think it was a natural progression. Gary Campion was brought up by two older brothers. Are we really dealing with this concept of hypermasculinity? If you look at this um, in relation to gender, it's very, very stereotypical. So you've got the hard man. Um, they play into these types of roles. Also in terms of identity, very often these, these people who you're talking about, you know, young people who have drifted without positive role models, they link themselves to the strong, the strong identity of, of the hard man, of the criminal, because not only does that, you know, establish them in terms of, of criminal underworld, it also gives them a sense of identity and a sense of self. Former Garda Brian Sherry has a unique insight into the criminal gangs that were active in Limerick in this era. They were the first YouTube gangsters in this country, brazenly marketing their violence. Yeah, and like I mean, openly like I mean, and making vast amount of money on drugs and everything else. So they were able to buy loyalty. They were able to buy firearms. They were able, you know, some of them were caught with rocket propelled, you know, grenades and everything. So like I mean, you have to look at the connections that these guys had, you know, to dissident Republicans and everything else that was involved in the melting pot. Down there. Was the intimidation used by the Dundon McCarthy's, for example, the key reason why they were able to operate blatantly, brazenly for so long? The intimidation that was going on in that city was absolutely astronomical. People were terrified. Witnesses were afraid of their life to give evidence, to talk to the guards, to even be seen talking to the guards. Guards were even being intimidated, were threatened, and, you know, shots were being fired at houses belonging to members of the Guard of Shia Khan. All that type of thing was going on. Why do you think Limerick developed this rather vicious gang culture? Was it all to do with drugs? Well, if you look at it in terms of a timeline in Limerick, there was definitely a massive change and a shift in terms of criminal activity when the university was established. Um, like gang culture has its traits, university culture, one of the unfortunate traits of university culture is in fact, you know, drug taking. And so the drugs that were being bought and sold were largely class A drugs like cocaine. Um, and there was a 30 million pound business there, again, in a very, very small vicinity. And so, you know, there was a lot of violence. Ah! 
most people form an understanding of hits and hitmen from what they see at the movies. And of course, the movies always like to present hits as if they take part in smoky bars and casinos. They're part of the criminal underworld. In reality, many hits take place in perfectly banal, ordinary, suburban settings, like this one. Brian Fitzgerald was murdered outside his Limerick home in November 2002. Gardy believe he was killed for trying to stop a drugs gang supplying the nightclub where he worked. The 34-year-old bouncer was shot a number of times in the head and body. Dundon McCarthy gang were making a big play at trying to take some of the, the drug turf from the Keane Colopies, who had been traditionally the, the main players in it. Doc's nightclub was known throughout Ireland. It was the most popular nightclub in the city. And Limerick was a really young, vibrant city, so there was a big market for drugs. Um, and the, the, the Dundon McCarthy's decided that they wanted to start selling their... their um, their gear in the in the club. What was the motivation for Brian Fitzgerald's murder? Well, he put his foot down and he decided that there was no way that they were going to be allowed into his club. He ended up having to make a complaint because they threatened him. He gave a statement and just before his murder, actually, he had withdrawn the statement because he was becoming increasingly worried about his wife and his two kids. But any rational gang would have seen the withdrawal of the statement as the end of the matter. Why did they go through with the murder? Rational and criminal gangs doesn't really go hand in hand usually, but the Dundons, I think they just really wanted to make their mark. They really wanted nobody to be left under any illusion, but they were going to rule the city. It was decided that an example had to be made of Brian Fitzgerald. English hitman James Martin Cahill was hired to carry out the murder. A getaway driver was brought up from Dublin. However, when the bike that was to be used in the hit developed a fault, the getaway driver backed out and it was left to Gary Campion to step into the breach. his problem. The bike sorted. If he doesn't want to do it, I will. All right. Grand saw. OK. All right, he's on his way. Give me the gun, so I'll do it. Come on. Come on. No. Why were you so keen to take the gun, Gary? He's nervous. He's going to balls this right up. Fucking mug. The pigs are on the way. Come on now, will you? Move. Oh my God. A disorganized hit the police are gonna catch the person who did it pretty quickly. They leave lots of evidence. This hit took place, though, in a cul-de-sac. And therefore, you had to have a way of getting in to the cul-de-sac, but crucially, also a way of getting out of the cul-de-sac. So the hitman knows he's taking a risk about being trapped in the area where the hit takes place. 
Now this is classic behavior of the organized hitman, the man who's done it before, working with an accomplice, and in particular, uh, using a motorbike as a way of affecting his escape. This was a very organized hit by an experienced journeyman hitman. With his involvement in the murder of Limerick bouncer Brian Fitzgerald, Gary Campion had demonstrated that he was much more than just muscle. He'd been a willing participant in the murder of an innocent man. Now he saw a career for himself as a hitman for hire, striking fear into the heart of Limerick's population. The murder of Brian Fitzgerald caused a huge degree of out outrage, particularly in Limerick. This was a man who was shot dead in cold blood. He was not involved in criminality. It was well known he hated drugs. He didn't want drugs in a nightclub he worked in. He'd only literally baited his child a few hours before he was shot dead. All this um, had, I suppose, caused huge outrage with the public, um, and it led to a massive guard investigation. Incredibly, rather than keep a low profile after the Fitzgerald murder, Campion seemed to revel in the violence that surrounded him. He went back to his old job as an enforcer for the McCarthy Dundon gang. So which one of you rats wants to fucking die first? Open your fucking mouth. Open it. Huh? How does that taste, boy? Huh? You want me to pull the trigger? Get the fuck out of it. Get on your knees now. Uh, Gary, well, put the gun get down, down, Gary! Got the gun! Boys are lucky, huh? Drop it! Get down! On your knees! All right, lads. Jesus, I was just joking see with them. See you then. Um, see you soon, huh? Come on. In October 2004, Campion was sent to prison for assault and threatening to kill. He'd been in and out of prison all of his life. This was nothing new to him. What he didn't realize, though, was that the police were now on his trail for the murder of Brian Fitzgerald. So often in a gangland murder, it's the incidental details that can help to crack open a case. An alert member of the public spotting something amiss, or perhaps a lazy gangster taking a shortcut can provide that crucial piece of evidence leading to a conviction. On the 29th of December 2002, both events came into play when at this very spot, Gardaí made their first breakthrough in the investigation into the murder of Brian Fitzgerald. The Gardaí literally found a weapon, a gun, that was used in the murder of Brian Fitzgerald. They found that in a river close to Limerick City. That brought them in to James Cahill. This is James Martin Cahill, the man who admitted killing bouncer Brian Fitzgerald outside his Limerick home. Cahill refused to identify his accomplice. Languishing in his prison cell, Campion still believed he was untouchable. Criminologist Colin Sumner has investigated how Limerick has tried to move beyond its violent past. I don't think anybody in Limerick is proud of uh, um, the, the reputation that um, is there. I think clearly it's a bit like Al Capone, never wanted his children to be gangsters. Um, and I'm sure that's true in the same way in Limerick. I mean, they want to move beyond it. I sometimes get a feeling that there's almost a conspiracy of silence about what's happened in the past. Would that be fair? 
people don't want to keep bringing the old stories up. They, they want to talk about the new. They want to talk about practical politics. What, what are people doing to actually move things forward? Um, and of course, some people want to be able to stand back from their pasts and be allowed to, 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 to live a normal, straight life. And I mean, let's face it, people do stop. They're looking to, 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 to an island that takes part in the 21st century and are very concerned about their part in that island. In Limerick, they're clearly rebranding. They're wanting to move on. They're wanting to define themselves by their future. Although, you know, I'm still stuck in the position where I feel unless you acknowledge your past, you can never truly move on, truly have the future that you want. The other thing I picked up from Colin, and my gosh, he's been in Ireland long enough to know, is that face-to-face -face cultures can be utterly, perfectly charming. But my gosh, if the wheel comes off, you'd better watch out. Although Campion was still holed up in prison, he was all the while honing his craft and developing a reputation as a man not to cross. The idea of prison is to rehabilitate evidently because he re-offended and re-offended, it didn't work. So the rehabilitation element of prison failed Gary Campion. Um, I think what prison did for Gary Campion, unfortunately, was actually enable him. Criminal underworld is a business. And so prison may have been a forum for actually, you know, criminal conferences, meeting people, meeting new contacts, being able to have the time on your hands to perfect your art, which unfortunately with, with Gary was murdering people and, and the drugs underworld. He was happy to boast about his, um, his hitman activities. He made no secret of the fact that he was a gunman for hire and he was happy to display his violent nature. They fucking call me Ryan, no! Ah, I killed people in this town for 10 grand. No fucking difficulty killing you for 20. We'll blow you away. You still have to go down to Dublin Road, you beat them. I'll have you blown away, Ryan. You still have to go down the Dublin Road every evening. That rant by Gary Campion is evidence that he's very comfortable in the world of hits and hitmen. By threatening the prison officer, Campion had earned himself an extra 18 months in jail. And although unrepentant for his crimes, he was a changing man. He no longer would be a lackey for the Dundon crew. I know of a few deaths out here, lads. Need to be sorted. I was just thinking maybe I could do a bit of work for you, you know. Help you sort a few things out. Might have something for you. Don't bother to me, boy. Whatever needs to be done. Why did Gary Campion switch sides? His older brother, Noel, realised that there was profits to be made for them in relation to uh, the drug dealing scene there, but profits that were being eaten up by the McCarthy Dundon gang. So this is ultimately what led uh, Gary to kind of switch allegiances and uh, connect to the Keane Colopy faction. In September 2006, Gary Campion left jail. He intended then to make a very public statement to demonstrate that he was now working for new masters. I don't just like to read about a particular hit or a murder. I like to be in the space where that murder or hit took place. And I use a technique called a criminological autopsy. Gary Campion had been out of jail for literally a matter of hours when he was picked up by one of his friends, Fat Frankie Ryan, just from the place where I have been walking from. There were two people in the car, Fat Frankie Ryan, 
and a friend, Errol Abraham. They make some inane banter, and then he pulls out a pistol and shoots. All right, you all calm down, relax. Camping gets out of the car. He points the gun across Errol Ibrahim and shoots Fat Frankie Ryan again, twice in the head. Can you imagine what Errol Ibrahim must have been thinking? He must have been thinking he was next on the list. But in fact, Campion lets him go free. Why? Well, this is a demonstration, it seems to me, of power. Campion has the power to decide who should live and who should die. He's godlike in his own imagination. What does it say of Campion that he was willing to kill his best friend? The fact that uh, Gary Campion knew Frankie Ryan gives you a chilling insight into uh, Campion's character. Gary's been described as uh, psychopathic, a kind of a coldness about him. It's Gary, some Gary have described him even as pure evil. 21-year-old Ryan was shot. Leaving Ibrahim alive was a, was a very bad mistake for Gary Campion in, in one sense. He was arrested by Gary, interviewed numerous occasions for withholding information in relation to the murder. Frankie Ryan's brother arrived to the Maerstone guard station and spoke to Ibrahim and told him that he would not be considered a guard informer or a rat within the community if he told Gary who the shooter was. Um, after this conversation, Ibrahim duly did this. Well, Gary, you've made yourself some nice new enemies this time, haven't you? Killing Frankie Ryan. No comment. You know the Dunnan's going to be coming after you, right? No comment. Might be a good time to start talking to us. No comment. OK, Gary. It's your funeral. Yeah. The net was starting to close around Gary Campion as his erstwhile allies, the Dundons, were hell-bent on revenge for the murder of their lieutenant, Frankie Ryan. Two men on a motorbike drove by and were ambushed at this junction by the gunman. On the 26th of April, his brother Noel was killed in a gangland hit. Related, Noel Campion was known to Gardy. Nobody has ever been convicted for this crime. But the police believe it was revenge for the killing of Frankie Ryan. Unbeknownst to both Campion and the Dundons, Brian Fitzgerald's murderer, James Martin Cahill, decided to turn on his former employers. 30-year-old has also agreed to testify against others allegedly involved in Mr Fitzgerald's death. And why did Cahill turn state's evidence? Because he claimed he was having um, flashbacks and nightmares. He was a very, very uh, disturbed individual. He felt that he needed to get this off his conscience. 
Limerick men Gary Campion of Moiros, John Dundon from Ballinacurra Weston, his brother Desi Dundon also from Ballinacurra Weston and Anthony Kelly from Kilrush County Clare. All four deny the murder of the 34-year-old outside his home in Corvally in November 2002. Evidence from Brian Fitzgerald's widow Alice was crucial in terms of backing up Cattle's story. His widow Alice gave evidence that her husband had left for work that evening after... Because she gave an eyewitness description of seeing camping on the night, describing his, um, his very dark eyes and, and his very distinctive eyebrows. And with this backup, the jury decided to convict Campion. However, no evidence whatsoever had been proven of John Dundon's role in the case. Cattle had contradicted himself in relation to uh, Desi Dundon's role in the murder, so both those guys were acquitted. And in relation to Anthony Kelly, again, there was um, conflicting evidence and Mr Kelly walked free. Was there ever any way that Gary Campion could have escaped from the background that you've described? I think if Gary Campion had made a rational choice to do so, then yes, maybe. However, the odds were always stacked against him. And although he had business acumen, um, I, I don't think he had the intellect and the foresight to be able to break those ties. How were the Limerick gangs finally smashed? It took many years for the Gardaí to get the necessary resources to tackle the gangs. Um, this finally happened, but only after the murder of two completely innocent men, Shane Gagan and Roy Collins. The Dundons had an unprecedented level of savagery, with the added pressure from the police, um, the constant raids. Eventually, their own junior associates uh, just got sick of them. Their own gang members, in many cases, turned against them. I think you've got to remember what the past was like so as to be able to move forward. You can't deny the past, can you? The past won't go away. We all have to accept the past and what happened in the past and build on the future. And the future of Limerick now is the kids that's grown up, whose families was involved in these feuding and all that, is to get, make sure these up and coming next generation don't get involved in it and continue it. Campion's story does seem to me to help us think about that age-old criminological question. Is the offender born or made? And, you know, I've got some sympathy for Gary Campion in terms of the background that he was born into. So I think we see that in the lessons of childhood, which is actually be violent or have violence done upon you, later on in adulthood, he was given that choice, which was either do the hit or have the hit imposed upon you. So, you know, either kill or be killed. A young man, almost to protect himself, would have to engage in violence as a way of forming, creating, and protecting his sense of self, his reputation. And that, to me, I mean, I've never had to face that in my background, and I wonder how many other young men face the same kind of background. Where does Gary pa Campion fit in our typology? For me, he's definitely not a novice. He's a journeyman hitman. I think that's where I would put him in our typography. He fits the profile of a local, uh, you know, low-end journeyman hitman, but clearly he's not the type of person who's gonna be hired by an international cartel to do a hit in Spain.